Hi, Peter Charles here of Hooked for Life Fly Fishing. And today, let's take another look at welding fly lines. And I'm going to do this right from the square one. This is going to be like fly line welding 101. Uh, you might have seen my really old videos on welding. They were done with very rudimentary uh, video equipment. So we're going to get into uh, welding again, only we're going to do it with better gear and more of a structured approach where I'm just going to be talking about what's involved in trying to get started in line welding. So to begin with, I want to talk about fly lines because it's all about the fly line really. And as you can see, I've got fly lines here in front of me. I've got some uh, heat shrink tubing, my uh, scissors, I've got a heat gun that I'll show you in a couple of minutes. And uh, I want to talk about the actual fly line material itself and what's happening when we weld. So you can see I've got this uh, little green loop here. This is green running line. It's a polyvinyl chloride. I think this is an old Cortland line. And I've welded this little loop at the end. And you can see it's quite neat and it holds quite well. Uh, if you wonder about the strength of these loops, and I will do a strength test in another video, um, this particular line here is uh, my saltwater striped bass line. It's probably the first or the second salt water line that I ever bought. And it has a welded loop. And I did this, I don't know, probably about 13 years ago, 12 years ago, 13 years ago, somewhere around there. And that's the original loop. It's still holding. And it's caught some very big bass. It's caught my largest bass. I've used this uh, every uh, summer in Cape Cod religiously. It's my 10 weight uh, airflow uh, salt, cold water salt line, the 40 plus version. Uh, so these loops can be quite durable. You can land big fish on them. You don't have to worry about a strength issue with them. And that's one of the things that I, I, I encounter when people say, oh, they're no good. Well, they're quite strong and they're done quite well. So what happens when you weld? Uh, well, if we look at this little uh, green loop here, what you're doing is you're taking the coating of the fly line and you're softening it, melting it, so it fuses together. Uh, we are not touching the core. Uh, the core, you want to stay as it is. You don't want to melt the core. You just want to melt the coating. And it, as you can see, it's close together in that green loop. You can see that it's all welded together. You can't even see where it ends, basically. It's so smooth. It works so well. And that is just being held together by the plastic. And you're saying, oh, that's no good. That'll hold not hold. Yeah, it holds. Uh, I've done a lot of strength tests with these things. And yeah, that holds quite well. So you don't have to worry about the strength element. And you can see what it looks like. And look, that one looks quite neat. Looks like it was a factory loop. And that's one I've done myself. So you, you don't have to worry about too much about um, strength. And you, you, you know, and, and you can get quite a neat appearance if once you get practiced at it. You can get quite good at doing this. So what are some of the issues that we face when we're putting together these uh, fly lines, uh, welding loops on fly lines? Well, one of the first things is there's two different kinds of materials out there. Very important to know this. Airflow makes its lines out of polyurethane. Everybody else uses polyvinyl chloride. And what's it, the importance for us when we're welding? Well, Polyurethane is supple right out of the tub. They don't have to add anything to it to make it supple. So you can weld it and it doesn't change properties when you weld it. And it has a relatively low, low uh, melting point, which makes it easy to weld. Polyvinyl chloride lines, uh, uh, polyvinyl chloride I should say, is relatively brittle material straight out of the can. So when a fly line company uses polyvinyl chloride and they want a supple fly line, they have to add plasticizers to it. And when we weld, what can happen is we can bake out the plasticizers so it becomes brittle. Now, that varies from manufacturer to manufacturer. I've got this line here is polyvinyl chloride. It, a loop on this particular line hangs together quite well. I've had other brands of uh, polyvinyl uh, chloride, I don't have any of them here right now, um, where... Uh, the uh, material had so much, uh, it was so supple, had s such a, a high degree of uh, plasticizers in it, so high concentration, I should say, is that when I welded them, those plasticizers evaporated, and the thing was so brittle that you go fishing with it once and it cracked. So 
uh, it's it's a bit of a toss up, and uh, you get to to learn that if it feels relatively stiff, it's probably going to weld well. If it feels super soft and supple, uh, that means there's a lot of plasticizers in that line, and it's probably going to crack on you once you start fishing it. So that's the risk with polyvinyl chloride. If you're uh, so as long as you're if you're welding airflow, no problem. If you're uh, Welding polyvinyl chloride, you know, it could be perfectly fine or you could have problems. The other thing is if you're going to mix materials, polyvinyl chloride has a higher melting point than polyurethane. So uh, the one thing I found has worked when I have combined materials is that if I used a skinny polyvinyl chloride line being welded to a thick polyurethane line, it worked. The other way around didn't. Uh, because the, uh, you, it took so much heat to get the PVC line to melt that the, the um, airflow polyurethane line was reduced to goo. So generally speaking, you want to try to, to weld like to like, poly, PVC to PVC and polyurethane to polyurethane. You end up with far less problems when you do that. So, okay, let's talk about different kinds of loops. So we have this particular uh, material here, this one. This is an old airflow, piece of an old airflow shooting head. It's quite thick. So if I tried to bend this thing in and make a loop, it would be a problem. I had difficulty doing it. However, if I use this skinny running line and I bent it around and welded it, just like this green loop here, no problem. It's going to be, uh, it's going to weld quite well. It'll look fine. It'll go through guides, no problem. So how do I handle this thick stuff? And I want to put a loop at the end of this thick stuff. What do I do? Well, I actually make the loop out of the skinny stuff and put it on the thick stuff. And I will do a video on how to do that. And I already have an old video that shows how to do this. But basically you're using running line and you're welding on a loop onto the end of the thick stuff. Okay, here's one where I have put two pieces together. So I, you can see that the, the running line is white and um, the fly line is cr uh, has a cream color to it. So when you look at the loop, you can see that the loop is white. So I've used a white running line and I welded it to this uh, cream colored line. So I've taken a piece of run uh, running line and just welded it on. That works like a charm. You know, if you have to weld a loop on the end of thick stuff, like the end of a shooting head, for example, You're, you bought a shooting head, it's too heavy, you take off a couple of feet to make it lighter, you can make a rear loop on a piece of shooting head doing that. You can even weld sink tip material to a floater to make your own sink tips. And again, I have a video on doing that. This is tricky. I'm not going to tell you it's easy. Uh, it, it takes a really practiced hand to just control the temperature just perfectly because the sinking material does not have a lot of plastic on it and it has a lot of tungsten in it which absorbs the heat. So it goes from not well, not melted to too much like that. So you end up getting, you have to have a fine eye to know when you've got to the point where this thing is going to uh, cook too much. So when you're setting out to weld, be aware whether you're using polyvinyl chloride or polyurethane lines, airflow. And the other thing you want to be aware of is that if you have a really soft, supple line, you know, it feels really, really soft, very supple in your hands, odds are that's not going to weld well because you'll cook out all the plasticizers. So what else do we need to get going? Well, a good pair of scissors with a sharp point. Fly tank scissors. There's You'll need these to get the uh, heat shrink off. Next thing you need is heat shrink. And I use three sizes. Uh, I use uh, 3 30 seconds uh, inside diameter. Uh, and that, this is the skinny stuff here. And it's used primarily for running line. Uh, so when I'm making running line lo loops, I use the 3 30 seconds uh, heat shrink. Now, uh, when I'm doing loops at the end of fly lines, like this one right here, I'm going to use the 1 8 ID because this stuff is a little bit thicker. So if I was putting a, a loop on the end of a fly line, I'd be using 1 8 And when it comes to putting back end loops on shooting heads, I use this thick stuff. It's uh, fat stuff, I should say. It's not thick. 
fat stuff. It's uh, 3 30 seconds inside diameter. Now, what is this material? As you can see, it's clear. That's very, very, very important. When you get heat shrink, make sure you get the clear stuff, not the opaque stuff. There's a lot of black and white and red and blue heat shrink out there for color coding. The problem is you cannot see when your material has started to melt. If it's opaque, you can't see. You're, you're just, you know, guessing. And I've done this. I tried using opaque stuff. I just couldn't get it to go. I just, just, you know, you'd get one part of the weld would be overcooked and the other part wouldn't be melted enough. So you've got to be able to see what you're doing. So you've got to use the clear stuff. Now this is poly, uh, poly olefin two to one. And here's the label. We'll put the label here and I will, um, zoom in on it so you can read this better. This is uh, typical of what I get, and you can see the specifications on it. You can buy this material from um, electronic supply stores. So any electronic supply store should have heat shrink, and hopefully they will have clear heat shrink. So it's polyolefin 2 to 1 clear heat shrink in 3 30 seconds, 1 8 and 3 16 sizes. That's what you're going to be using for... Um, these welding and you can see you can buy packs like this so and this is not expensive so i mean buy, buy a pack and be done with it and then you'll never have to buy it ever again so if you find it grab some and be done with it now on to the last bit which is very important which is our heat gun this is a, a 1500 watt heat gun you really don't need anything more than that some of the important aspects on it you need a concentrator nozzle so when you buy the heat gun, they often come with a nozzle um, collection. That This is removable. So you make sure you've got a concentrator or you have the heat shrink adapter. Some of them are sold with heat shrink adapters, which is fantastic. It's built for, you know, shrinking heat shrink. It's great for doing line welding. In fact, if you look at what uh, professionals use, they're using a heat gun a high grade heat gun with the heat shrink adapter on the end of the heat shrink nozzle and it works like a charm. But just a regular concentrator nozzle will do the job. Don't use one without a nozzle because it just blasts heat all over the place. You'll get a very uneven weld and it's just difficult to handle. So the concentrator nozzle allows you to be very specific as where that you direct the heat. You can control it. You can't control it very well when there's no nozzle and it's just spraying everywhere. Now, you can see this one has a, a heat dial at the end. So I've got a, a two position switch, a high low switch, and I've also got the ability to ch control the temperature with this dial. These things are not expensive, like $20, $30. So you're not spending a, a great ton of money on these things. I mean, if you want to go a really high grade, you'll spend 300 bucks, but I think this is about like a $25 heat gun, something in that ballpark, I can't remember. But the, the things you're looking for are the heat controller on the back where you, so just a, a dial, you want a concentrator or the heat shrink adapter, and you want, you know, that high-low position helps. And as I say, a 1,500-watt gun is more than enough, and you don't have to spend a lot of money on it unless you pre prepare to do it professionally. So that's what's involved in getting started in uh, welding your own lines. I do recommend having lots of scrap around to practice. So if you've got some old cruddy old fly lines that you've stepped on and ruined, you know, well, first off, you can repair them. I've got a video on doing that. And, uh, you know, if you've got some scrap, got an old fly line, cut it up, weld some loops on it, get some practice before you start going on and welding an expensive one. So, there you go. That's how to get started in line welding. Cheers. Fish. Good one.